mic check, please. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Ducks Limit Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Jennings. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Brazier. My name is John Gordon. I'll be your host. And I'm your host, Katie Burke. Welcome to the Ducks Unlimited Podcast, the only podcast about all things waterfowl. From hunting insights to science-based discussions about ducks, geese, and issues affecting waterfowl and wetlands conservation in North America, we bring the resource to you, the DU Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Ducks on the Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Jennings. Joining me in the studio today is Dr. Mike Brazier. Mike, how are you? I'm doing great, Chris. How are you? If we sound like we're a little fired up today, we are because today, one, it's the official kickoff for our season of the Ducks Unlimited podcast, but also today is Duck Day. Today is the day that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service releases their duck numbers. Here at Ducks Unlimited, we are fired up about that. So Mike, why are we so excited about this day? Today is actually exciting for a couple of reasons. Number one, most importantly, this is the first time since 2019 that we've been able to have this conversation with actual data across the entire survey area in North America. We've talked at length from on numerous episodes for the past two years about cancellation of the survey in 2020 and 2021, and we talked through all the different machinations that Fish, Fish and Wildlife Service did over the last two years to generate a few estimates that are used for setting harvest regulations and things of that nature. But this is the first time in three years that we've been able to look at what the status of waterfowl populations is across the entirety of, of North America. And I feel like, you know, I watch CNBC on occasion. And of course, it's like every day they have these high impact financial reports from all different sectors of the economy. And the numbers are breaking at a certain time and they're rushing to get the numbers out. Kind of what it feels like here. It's the only time, though, during the year when we have an opportunity to do that. And we've not had it the last two years, or last three years, really. So, uh, without further ado, what are the numbers? Yeah, right? what are the numbers? Let's talk for 20 <laughs> so, more minutes before we tell you what the numbers are. So, so the, the, the survey is broken down into the traditional survey area and eastern survey area. And we're going to cover a lot of this in way more detail. The big number that comes out of this report is the number from the traditional survey area, which is essentially the mid-continent up through Alaska. And the total duck number for this year in the traditional survey area was... million, and that is 12% below the 2019 estimate, last time we did this, and... And what was that? I'm actually looking 4% at the numbers here. Below 4% the long, below the long-term yeah. average for that total duck number. That includes 10 duck mm-hmm. species and then I think 10 common duck species and then maybe four or five others. We'll get into all that uh, later on. The other big number that comes out of this is the May pond count. The pond number, pond count there in the prairies of the U.S. and Canada. As expected, that number is up. And that is... What am I looking at here? Total pond estimate was 5.5 million, which was 9% higher than the 2019 estimate and similar to the long-term average. So the when one you thing say that similar it, to, like it's 4% higher, but you guys on the science side, you know, once you get to a certain level of how close that number is, it, it's very similar, yeah, correct? Yeah, okay. that's right. That's right. So we're, we're talking like 5.5 versus a long-term average of 5.2. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sorry about that. No, that's so, fine. I'm just trying to but, put it in layman's terms and, here. And so the other thing that's kind of worth talking about here is, well, how did that f- align with our expectations? Uh, we've we spoke with a number of people throughout the past year about habitat conditions and so forth. I'll be honest, neither of those numbers, 34.2 total ducks in the mid-continent or in the traditional survey area, or 5.5 million ponds in the U.S. and Canada, n- neither one of those really surprised me. That's in line with my expectation. <clears throat> I expected duck numbers to be down because we had uh, near, we, we had extreme drought across that major prairie production area last year. We knew there were very few ducks produced. And very important point that I'm sure we'll harp on many times, what we're counting in terms of ducks in this report are the ducks that return back to breed in the spring. Not, you're not counting broods. You're not counting that's ducklings. Right. We're not doing, this is not a production survey. 
uh, we're counting the birds that were left over basically from the past two or three seasons, which we know were characterized by extreme drought last year, very extreme drought. So that 34.2 number is not surprising to me. It's kind of disappointing, right? It's the lowest number in nearly 20 years. I think the lowest that you'd have to go all the way back to maybe 2004 or five. I, I need to look that up, but it, nearly 20 years since yeah. we've seen a number that low. And the 5.5 million ponds in the U.S. in Canada is also consistent with with what I expected. I don't. I, it was kind of harder to ballpark that number to kind of prognosticate what what that was going to be, but I knew it would be up because of all that rain we had in the eastern Dakotas, rain we had in Manitoba. Now we don't know what the number was last year, right? Yeah. But even I think most of us expected that number to to be up a little bit from uh, and, from, from and 2019. Had, and you had gotten some information from like Dr. Scott Stevens, who's on the podcast regularly. You had talked to him already. You knew that the had, yeah. central Canadian prairies were pretty dry. And so the expectation there, as far as like southern Saskatchewan and into eastern Alberta even, it was pretty dry going yeah. into it. That's right. Um, and I think even yesterday, you and I were talking, you were kind of expecting this number to be a little bit lower the than what it was. The number I was. I was expecting the duck number. I th- we, we talked about having a little office pool here. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's this is was a very unusual year because it had been so long since yeah. we had a number, and you had less to go on. And so we were we we, we joked about maybe we should set up an office pool and and do a and, well, well. You and I, <laughs> I I marched down to your office and I think we had a little bet yesterday. <laughs> well, I have to, I have to and go it, back and see what that is. I, I think I think you might have won that bet. I think I did. And then I walked out with a couple other coworkers and I said, you know, you're a degenerate gambler when you go down and challenge <laughs> duck numbers with the duck scientist. Uh, I was I was expecting it to be a little bit lower than this. I'm happy. Happy that it was not. I think there's some a lot of positive signs to be taken from that. And, you know, most of the species, we're going to get into all the species next week. This is just a very quick 10,000-foot uh, look at this. There are some bright spots in some species. There are, uh, most of them are down, not surprising, from 2019. And and we'll go through all of those uh, as, as we get into more episodes next week. Uh, we do want to, I think reference what we saw in the eastern survey area as well. That's another important part of this survey. And you're talking about eastern Canada, you're talking about northeastern U.S. states, and let me, I'm going to have to look at the numbers here. They're, and they don't survey as many ducks in that part of the country. You know, it's not as, as much of a list that they put together in terms of these population numbers. But I'm just going to go through this right here. Estimate for golden eyes was similar to the 2019 estimate. Uh, and the long-term average ring-neck ducks, green-wing teal, similar to 2019 and their long-term average. Uh, mergansers were up 13% over 2019 and 20, up 20% over the long-term average. Now here's the. Now we're going to get into black ducks and mallards in that eastern survey area. This year's estimate of black ducks was uh, 800,000, which is similar to 2019. Actually, it's up 100,000 from 2019, but yeah, again, a statistician yeah, say similar to, and it was similar to the 1998 to 2019 average. Um, there's another little thing there about black ducks, not all that important. The estimate of mallards in the eastern survey area. Um, was 1.2 million, which was 15% above the 2019 estimates. That's going to make some people happy, but similar to the long-term average. But anytime, you know, we've talked a lot about eastern mallards and kind of what's going on with that population, trying to figure out what's going on with it. Anytime we have an, an increase, that's going to be something to um, to kind of be a little bit happy about. Well, of course, longer term in, in the management of waterfowl, migratory bird populations, what's more important or longer-term trends. So it's not like we're declaring major success or major failure on any particular species that we may talk about in this report. But these, and that's the reason why these data points over such a long period of time are so important is that you're interested in trends and trajectory from a population sustainability standpoint. Now, there's also the harvest management implication of these numbers. Uh, we're not going to get into that today. There is another report that's out right now from the Fish and Wildlife Service that that puts those um, numbers forward, puts those harvest, those adaptive harvest management protocols out there and shows what the recommendations are going to be. But then there's a lot of other discussions that have to happen at, with the states before those recommendations get translated into actual regulations. And to be clear, those regulations uh, that would be informed from this year's numbers, survey numbers, 
will not occur until or do not affect the uh, the regulations until 23-24. You know, our regulations for this year are set. The numbers that we're looking at right now from uh, from 2022 are going to come into effect with regulations next year, yeah. 23, 24. And and like Mike said, we're going to get into individual species. Um, we'll do we'll get a little bit deeper dive into the Eastern Survey. We'll, there's some information on geese. We'll definitely get into that. Um, and but you know, just right off the top of your head, you know, before we dive in on later podcast, what is glaring from this survey that you're looking at now, like species wise? You know, I, pintails are, are going to be one that have to stand out a little bit because they continue to be down. That's not, it's not surprising. I don't, I don't think anything that I'm looking at here is terribly surprising. There's an uptick in redhead numbers, which is a bit perplexing considering how dry things were last year, but that could mean that a lot of those birds last year uh, overflew the prairies, chose not to breed. Maybe they had a high overwinter survival or something. Maybe they were able to, I don't know, um, survive at a higher rate. Maybe more of them went back. I don't know. You're kind of speculating there. But redhead numbers are actually up. Cans are down. But, you know, from a, yeah, pintails continue to be a long-term concern. Blue wings continue to be a bright spot. We'll get into the specifics of that next week. I don't think anyone will complain <clears throat> about that. No, but, but you know, Larger, larger scale, and I know our, our chief scientist and our CEO share this sentiment, really what the last, what last year reminded us of and should have reminded all of us as waterfowl hunters, as waterfowl conservationists, of, is of the, the fragility of the landscapes that these birds depend upon, I, plus the resilience of the populations. Mm-hmm. And, and so those two things, we have to be... We have to be mindful of, on kind of on the front end, the drought from last year showed us, and the numbers that we're seeing this year, the lowest population size in 20 years, should show us that as that prairie habitat goes, so go these duck populations. But then the other thing that we see is some examples of species in here that continue to be above long-term average. Most of them are dipping below that long-term average or dipping below the North American Waterfowl Management Plan goal right now as an effect of that mm-hmm. drought, which can simulate, be a very good simulator of habitat loss if you think about it. And so when you simulate severe habitat loss, you start seeing some of the consequences of that in some of these uh, drops in population numbers. But... There's also some resiliency in these populations. That also is, a, is something to be mindful of. So it, it was a good <clears throat> reminder. These are going to be some of the lowest numbers, uh, breeding population numbers that many of our waterfowl hunters have ever experienced. Yep. Uh, and, and the you know, the other thing that I guess people want to know is, all right, that's the spring number. What does this mean for the fall flight? That's where that 5.5 million pond number comes into play because that's the fuel for production that the birds would have experienced this summer. And that was a bright spot. And we know that there will be, will have been greater production this year than there was last year, at least in the prairies, because of the great uh, increase in pond numbers. That's something to be excited about if you're a hunter. It's not going to be a massive fall flight. I don't think there's anything that would tell us that right now. Uh, but there will nevertheless be successful hunts to be had out there. There's going to be a larger percentage of um, of young birds in the population this year than there were last year. That's a good thing. Um, so, yeah, there's some reasons to be optimistic, both, you know, I guess in the short term, if you're a hunter, it certainly could be a lot worse. Yeah. If, if things hadn't turned around for us the way they did late late winter and spring up in the Dakotas and eastern Canada, uh, we'd be singing a different tune. Yeah. And, you know, just for me, uh, you know, considering myself the layman, not the, the scientist, I'm just looking at this like a, the average waterfowl hunter would. You know, the minus 23% change in mallard numbers from 2019. I mean, that sounds horrible, but is it? it's not as bad as what, you know, you're not, it's not gloom and doom quite yet for, you know, that, that some no, people will all. approach not, it as. No, you know. not at all gloom and doom. You know, 23% decline, that's about... That's that's in line with expectations, man. You cannot have as severe of a drought as you did last year and not expect to see a drop in mallard production, mallard population size. And again, an important reminder, think about last year's drought as a simulator of habitat loss. That's what you need to be thinking about. Whenever we talk about the importance of conserving wetlands and grasslands in the prairies, 
That's what we're talking about, is trying to avoid those type of future scenarios in which we have a dry landscape, not necessarily dry because of drought, but dry because all the wetlands have been drained and all the, all the grasslands have been converted to, to some other, or other form of use. Long-term average on the mallards, they're only down 9% from that LTA, long-term average. So we still have a healthy mallard population, but reminds us of the vulnerability of these populations to the loss of their habitat, whether it be temporary from drought or long-term due to other things. Yeah. And another couple of things, I'll kind of set the table for uh, some podcasts that we're going to do probably, you know, later down the line, maybe next week. Um, it'll be interesting to talk about that green wing number. Yeah. They're down 32%. Yeah, yeah, that's a surprise. Um, that's always interesting. And just getting into the details of where those birds are breeding also, you know, those are, it's a boreal breeding bird. Yeah. Um, and so that'll be a fun conversation. Also the redheads jumping, you know, plus 35 and then plus 36 over the long term. Um, you know, that's, that's a significant number, you know, that just jumping off the chart at me. And it's interesting to maybe break that down and see where, you know, look at where those numbers were counted and kind of feel like, man, like maybe they, those birds just found some really wet areas where, you know, maybe that that's just something to dive into. Yeah, you know? there's some interesting numbers. When we get into this by species level and then survey region, there's some interesting numbers here. I'm looking across this series of charts here, and this is sort of a shout out to our Pacific Flyway hunters and people that care about waterfowl out there. If you look at the Alaska Yukon Territory strata, most birds were up. Pintails were actually down from no, pintails were up big time from the 2019 average in in. Um, not average from the 2019 number in that uh, in Alaska in that northern survey region, but down from the long term average. Uh, and that's one that's see. a good reminder, you know, to our audience. Who's, so Alaska overall is pretty good, pretty yeah. Good. yeah. And, and just a reminder that you know some people are looking at these charts, and you have to picture this this landscape level view of things. Yeah, you know, like that's right. You know, it's such a large landscape. I mean, you got into the eastern survey, then you jumped immediately to the Alaska. Yeah. You know, we're talking about you know huge landscapes here so um, that's just something to keep in mind and and hope everybody tunes in here yeah. the next couple of weeks I'm excited to break it down I, I know that I know Mike is as well he's all fired up yeah nothing more that nothing I like more than duck data duck data and that's, we got a lot of it right now that's awesome yeah Hey, you know, as we're analyzing these numbers, I want people to remember if you want to look at the chart and you want to really get into these numbers and get into what not only Ducks Unlimited CEO, but also Ducks Unlimited's chief scientist, Steve Adair, has to say about these numbers, you can visit ducks.org forward slash duck numbers. That's ducks.org forward slash duck numbers. And it'll be in the show notes. Cool. Well, hey, I appreciate it, Mike. This has been fun. Looking forward to next week. Absolutely. Thanks, Chris. Me too. I'd like to thank my co-host, Dr. Mike Razor, for sitting down with us and breaking down, briefly analyzing the BPOP survey, waterfowl and habitat survey that's put out by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, I'd like to thank our producer, Chris Isaac, for putting the show together and getting it out to you. And I'd like to thank you, the listener, for joining us and supporting wetlands conservation. Thank you for listening to this episode of the DU Podcast. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show. And visit www.ducks.org slash dupodcast for resources based on today's topics, as well as access to more episodes. Opinions expressed by guests do not necessarily reflect those of Ducks Unlimited. Until next time, stay tuned to the Ducks. Stay tuned to the Ducks.